Okay, so we're going to do app engine today. We got it all set up yesterday. And basically all we did was follow the instructions that are available on the docs, um, which you can find, uh, I put it at the top of the document, but um, if you search for app engine, right here, first thing. Um, and so these are all the docs. So basically what we did is we followed the Go tutorial, and that gets you set up. Um, but it's pretty easy to install. So what I want to do this morning is give a basic walkthrough of what App Engine is and why you'd use it and all that kind of stuff. And then we'll, we'll see some, uh, we'll get started on some actual services in, in App Engine today. Um, so why App Engine? Uh, I think you saw a little bit of that. I sort of gave a, a bit of an argument for that when I showed you how I had to set up the machine manually, and that's hard and requires a lot of knowledge. And uh, like I said, if that's not what you're interested in, it can be kind of tedious. If it is what you're interested in, then like I said, you can have a whole career being an operations person. Um, but that's not really programming. That's that's more knowing about how to set up machines and stuff. Uh, so basically, the idea is that with App Engine. Google does that for us. Google is our ops team, okay? Uh, we're, we're handing off that responsibility to them. And so we run our applications on the Google infrastructure. That means Google has a team of engineers and ops people who are responsible for maintaining their systems. And that's what I mean by we sort of outsourced it to them. Um, which, you know, if you're a company, might sound kind of terrifying. That means you've given, a, you know, one of your core responsibilities away to somebody else. Um, so why would you, you know, that doesn't seem like a good idea, but it turns out in general that uh, the sort of reliability that you'll get on App Engine is probably as good as you can do on your own. Uh, it's pretty easy to get started with. We saw that. We were able to get an app up and loaded in, you know, less than an hour. And it actually is pretty affordable, at least to start. And so the way it works is that on App Engine, if you log into your App Engine account, um, and you go look at your app, uh, the initial app you create is uh, free. It doesn't cost you anything. And the way they do that is they have quotas. Um, sorry, that's the old UI. Here's the new one. Uh, they have quotas. And so, where are those listed? Here, quota details. Um, and you can see all these quotas, they're completely documented here, and they have a lot of them. They tell you the things you can do for free. Um, but there's actually a surprising amount of headroom on the app engine for, for what you can do for free. Uh, for example, storage, you can have five gigs of free space, you know, all, all this kind of stuff they, they detail uh, for you. Um, but the idea is that once, so you can get started really easily, and for most, you know, companies who provide startup or something, you know, you start with zero users and you're hoping to add users. And the idea is that eventually you run out of the free quotas, you can switch to billing. It's expensive, but it's not too expensive. Okay? It's a lot less than hiring an operations person. It's a lot less than going to a data center and buying your own hardware. Okay? Um, and so that's the nice flexibility of, of using App Engine. And that's why you might want to use what they call a PaaS, a platform as a service. And, and that's why you might want to use App Engine for your company. Um, the other thing that's become more attractive about App Engine than it used to be, so App Engine is actually, it's been around a while, it's been around since 2008, um, which is surprising, uh, is that Google has added more, they've started to compete more with Amazon Web Services and other companies, and they've added more capabilities to their sort of collection of, of services they provide for hosting. Um, and so you can, in addition to having an app engine application, you can purchase a virtual machine. And that's like a machine that you can manage completely on your own, like I was doing yesterday. Um, and so you have that ability. You also have the ability to do Cloud SQL, so you can spin up a MySQL database, for example, which is a more traditional. We'll see the one built in app engine is very different than SQL. But if you want a SQL, you can get one. And so the point is that it's way more flexible than it used to be. So 
say you're a, a company and you start out an app engine and you start adding services, your basic websites and app engine, and you develop a product that doesn't really fit in the app engine ecosystem so well. Uh, it does a lot of really custom stuff and doesn't fit into how you would use app engine. You can spin up your own machine, run it on that, and connect the two very easily. And so now App Engine doesn't look, uh, you know, now it looks way more attractive than it used to because it can grow with your business, right? Uh, you, can, you can choose how to use it or not to use it uh, as much as you want. And so that's a really cool feature that didn't used to be there. Um, and that's kind of what sets uh, set App Engine apart from other similar platforms as a service is that flexibility. Um, and so uh, we're not probably going to do any of that, but I just want to mention it that it can do that. Um, so how does App Engine work? Uh, they have a document on here, which is really interesting, that talks about that, um, if I can find it. Maybe it's in this handling request. Um, but the basic idea is that App Engine is uh, what they call sandbox, okay, which is a nice colorful name. Uh, and the idea is that uh, you, you, it runs like regular code, but you're limited in what it can do. It can't do everything a regular computer can do. The App Engine sandbox is a sort of safe environment, right? Like for a kid, you put him in a sandbox. He can play and make things, but you know, he can't go outside the sandbox. Uh, similar idea for, for us. So there's some restrictions in what you're allowed to do. In particular, you can't use the unsafe package. We didn't talk about unsafe, uh, but some advanced stuff in, in Go you'll do with unsafe, uh, which is a great name for the package, right? contains operations that step around the types of TD Go programs. Uh, and so you can do things like transform a Go pointer into a pointer to an arbitrary type and then convert it back again. Um, so this, this allows you, uh, so Go code is safe. It, you're not allowed to like uh, um, go past the end of an array or something. Uh, but you can do this and then you can't. So if you use the unsafe package, it's like go back to the way C did things and you can do anything you want. Uh, why would you want to do that? There are some reasons why you might. Uh, sometimes you don't have a choice. If you have to interface with the C library, you kind of have to. Um, uh, other, other things you can do that are, are kind of neat is that you can, if I have a, a byte slice, I can like, convert it into a slice of floats or something without actually copying any data by bypassing the type system by using it. Say. But we didn't do any of that. We're not going to do any of that. But the point is you can't do it in App Engine, because you're in the sandbox, it doesn't let you. Uh, other restrictions, ones that we might actually run into, you can't write to the file system, it's a read-only file system. So we can't write files in App Engine. But that's okay, because you're not supposed to, anyway, you're supposed to use cloud storage. So um, there, there are usually as an alternative to the things you can't do. I don't think you can make outbound HTTP requests, they can only get inbound. So, you know, I can't from my app make it called google.com. If I want to do that, I have to use a service they provide to make outbound HTTP requests. So that's a, another restriction. Um, and there are others, but basically we live in that sandbox environment. And actually, uh, last year at, at GoForCon last year, uh, there was a talk given about how they implemented App Engine for Go. And super interesting talk if you're interested in, in that sort of details of how they did it, but it's really cool uh, how they how they did that. But um, the neat thing about Go on App Engine is that unlike some of the other platforms like Java, um, the, we saw this already, the, the Go App Engine, it's just the HTTP one. So the changes needed to, to make it work on App Engine were tiny, right? We barely changed anything, um, as long as you stay in the sandbox. But uh, for the, some of the other platforms, it's a little more, right? Um, because there is no equivalent out of the box solution in those other languages for how you do this. And so you may have done it one way in Java that you can't do on App Engine, and so you have to rewrite the code. Um, so the truth uh, is it goes the other direction too. Um, so one of the downsides of App Engine is you build your application using all of these services. What if you want to leave App Engine? Well, you don't have a data store. Like, there's no product that gives you the data store. Uh, that's part of App Engine. So you would have to rewrite your code to use some other database. Okay? Uh, and so uh, part of the reason why people necessarily don't want to use App Engine is that vendor blocking. Okay? It's hard to get out once you've done that. Uh, but like I said, because of this flexibility with NPMs, 
staying in is easier than it used to be. Because uh, people used to say, oh, what if I grow too big and I want to leave? And it's like, well, now you can just stay because you can, it can grow with it. So, but you do have that vendor lock-in pro problem, uh, but, in, but in general, it's pretty, pretty nice. Um, right, so we saw how we, we do App Engine, right? We have these requests and, and it routes it based on that app spot domain name, right? We went to projectid.appspot.com. You can also do this kind of stuff, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can do, here it is, version ID, dash dot, dash latest. Um, and so, maybe we'll show, I'll show an example of that in a second. But you can run multiple versions of your application and access them separately, which is really cool because that means you could work on the code for the next version and then you push it up there, but don't make it live yet. And you can play around with it and then switch to it uh, with, with the UI. And it has some other features like that uh, and they detail all the, the kinds of things you can do. Um, but in general, we should just be able to use HTTP and it'll be all good. Um, and we saw how the apps were laid out, right? So. We made a folder. Inside that folder, we had an app YAML. And this is what App Engine uses to know how to route traffic to your application. Um, and so the first thing is the project ID. And we saw how to get that. And then the version. So if you change the version, it will show up in the list uh, in here. There it is, versions. Um, and so you'd see another one in here. Uh, so maybe we'll do that in a second. But so you can have multiple versions of your app running and you can switch between them. You can only run one at a time with uh, as the main one. Uh, but uh, and then you have runtime go and then API version go one. So those are just pretty much canned values that you should be using. Because like I said, App Engine supports Python and Java as well, but we're using Go. Uh, and then you have this handler section, and in here you can define various routes. So this is meaning everything basically. And they all have this special script colon underscore go underscore app. And that means use go for these URLs. So I could put in there other URLs, you know. Uh, and they have some examples in the docs. Um, and so, you know, you might say, uh, you'd probably still make this a go app, but maybe you'd add restrictions on who can access it or something. Uh, and we'll see how to do that later. Uh, so in general, we, we don't mess too much with the YAML file, but sometimes we have to add stuff in here. You can add static file handlers, but like I said before, you can just use Go to do files, and it's no real big deal. Uh, but either way, we do that. Um, but but we don't spend a ton of time in here. Uh, just make sure this matches what you want it to be in the uh, in here, right? This the same application up here. And then, so we have our YAML file, and then right next to it, we'll have a bunch of Go files. And the package here doesn't matter, it could be anything you want. You can just leave it as main, um, that's what I did. And then basically all we did was we got rid of hand HTTP listen and serve, uh, and put our code in an init instead of in the main. And then uh, that was pretty much it. All the rest just kind of worked. Now there's a bug in this program, but I'll show you how we can determine there was a bug. Um, Okay, so I saved that code and I ran go app serve to see it locally, and I ran go app deploy to push it out to app engine. Okay, um, and then it was accessible by going to this id dot spot dot com, which we saw. Now mine has a problem. You have blank page. If I open my uh, the development tab down here, you can see I get five hundred. So that's not good, right? So there's obviously a bug in my program. You're a good man, Paul. It's Friday. <laughs> you are a good man. Thank you. No, thank you for being here and informing us with all your knowledge. <laughs> I don't know, I, I see a contradiction because he's doing nice things and bringing coffee, but he's, bringing, he's wearing a Darth, uh, Darth Vader shirt. <laughs> Sorry, some of us are on the dark side. <laughs> Darth, Darth Vader is such a nice guy. <laughs> so uh, we get this uh, 500 error, which is a problem. So how can I find the details of why I got this 500? Because if I look in here, I don't see anything interesting at all. All I know is I got a 500. And the reason why I'm not seeing anything is because this is not 500 I generated. 
This is my program fraction. Uh, and so we can go to App Engine, and there is a logs tab in here under monitoring, monitoring logs. And this shows you logs, which is super handy. So I can see this request here, the slash, see these big red exclamation points, and look under here, and there's my stack trace of what went wrong. Um, and so somewhere in here is the, the code uh, handle index. Yeah, hello.go line 31. That's well hard to read. Uh, yeah, and stack traces are a little hard to, to digest, so we'll be just talk about how you do them. The idea is that you go to the top. The top is going to tell you the error. Uh, this says invalid memory address or no pointer dereference. What this means is I probably I probably did something that returned an object an error, and I probably ignored the error. And then when I tried to use the object, it was nil, and so it caused this panic. So nil nil reference exceptions are super common as a program mistake. Um, and so that's usually what it means. I, I tried to do a dot method on something that didn't exist. Uh, and, so, and so you see the error. That doesn't always tell you what's wrong with your program. That means somewhere I have an invalid memory address or a no pointer to reference. But it doesn't where. To find out where, you have to use the stack trace. And so the way stack trace is going to work is you're going to see a stack for, for every go routine. Um, so each go routine has its own stack. So each one has its own stack trace. Uh, the one at the top is usually the one you're looking for. And so that's all shown here. Uh, you know, it says go routine 45 running. And then it tells you the line that produced the pin. Okay? So in this case, exit.go line 476 is the one that produces the pin. The line below it is the thing that called this. Okay? It's the thing that called the method that caused this. And so the thing that call, called that was hello.go. And it just keeps going down with all the things that call back. Okay? And that's why it's a stack trace. It's, it's tracing the whole stack of execution um, that resulted in the panic. And so in general, there's going to be a lot of other things in here because your request is being thrown through the HTTP library. And so you're seeing those in here. But just look for the code that you're doing. Because it's unlikely they're the problem. It's probably something you did. Now, sometimes it's something they did, but it's usually something you did. Uh, and as you know, uh, often with new programmers, they, they tend to sort of assume that their code is correct, that everybody else did something wrong, right? They always sort of lead to the, the most unlikely of explanations, you know? It was a, a cosmic ray that caused a bit to flip. Yeah, that's gotta be what went wrong. It's like, no, you probably wrote something wrong. That's probably what's the problem. Um, and so usually it's in your code that's gonna be the issue. Uh, and so we can go to my hello.go program and look at line 31. And here's where the method uh, failed. But I can see right away what's wrong with my program. Does anybody else see what's wrong with my program? Uh, I'm referencing a file on my file system that does not exist on App Engine. Mm -hmm. Because it's an absolute this isn't in my project. It's not inside of here. It's on, you know, it's in my downloads folder. That's not correct, right? This should be somewhere inside of my project. Because when I push this to App Engine, it doesn't push all the files on my computer to App Engine. It only pushes this folder. So when it tries to access this on App Engine, it's like, that doesn't exist. I ignored the error. So this ends up uh, being nil, passes it here, and it doesn't actually result in a panic but this would have been a problem too if it had gotten there. But it failed before it did because this happened first. Um, so we can fix this program. So what I'm going to do is in day five, I'm going to copy this Hello World program into day five. Just paste it in there. Um, so now I moved it over here. So let me close these so we don't accidentally edit the wrong one. So here's a neat thing about this is that if you keep the same application ID, it'll overwrite the old. Um, so that's kind of cool. So we can just edit this one and change this. So what I want to do is uh, I'm going to move this file into the project. So I'm copying that. And then, um, where am I? 
need to go to day five. Whoops. And then hello world. And then I'm going to copy. Well, I think I have an assets. Yeah. So if I go to assets, I'm going to make a directory here for images. Image. And then I'm going to go in there and copy this image I had into here. Um, so a neat trick with copy and move, if you just do dot slash, it'll add the name automatically. So you don't have to type the whole name again. And so now it plopped it in there. So now I just changed the reference into one that's relative to that folder. So now it'll become assets slash image. And then the name of the image. And I think this will fix my program. So the general process now is going to be that I go to my uh, folder here. Uh, back up one. So I'm in uh, get out combo. I know it's an example. So, uh, so Caleb, when you when we upload this to App Engine, it's the whole day five folder that you'd upload to. No, no. Is considered your whole project or the this one? The hello world. Oh, the hello world. Okay. Yeah. And so now, the first thing you do when you're debugging an issue like this is you test it locally. Uh, and so you do go app serve. And then I will hit localhost 8080. OK, so that seems to be working locally. And then I say go app deploy. But actually, I'm going to do something different because my go app deploy doesn't seem to be working. Going back in time here. Type go out. By the way, that app config pi update dash oauth 2 is in the link of useful web resources, which I've shared with everybody. And, uh, and if go out deploy doesn't work, that's a really good little line of code to make. Yeah, I'll, I'll paste it in here. Because <laughs> um, I've hit that a couple times too. I'm like, what? And I don't know why it doesn't. It's supposed to do that by default, but for yeah. some reason it's not. So instead of typing go app deploy, you can type this, which is all it's doing. And that this OAuth 2 makes it use OAuth instead of having to enter your email password. Um, but I know like Paul's computer just did it right properly. So I don't know why in mine it's doing it wrong. But. And I've, I've had it sometimes in the book circuit. You do it one way and then switch it and it switches back. Uh, but, it, but anyway, what it'll do is if you haven't logged in yet, it'll make a link. You click it, you press say yes, and it does the rest for you. Which is great. You don't have to enter an email or password. Or um, okay, so I deployed it. Okay, and you know it tells you how it's deploying. And sometimes this can take a little while, but it was pretty quick this time. Um, and we can reload over here. And it should be fixed now. Okay, see, I fixed it. Um, so now it works over here. Okay, so that's the general process. You might look through the logs and App Engine. You might do whatever you're going to do, and then you go back to your app, make the changes, test them locally, redeploy. Okay? And that's the general flow. Uh, what's missing from that flow that would be more, more typical is we're not using Git, and we probably should be using Git. So the process would be more like pull the latest version, make the change, test it locally. If everything's good, commit it, push it to GitHub, then redeploy. Also, in addition to that, a lot of companies do code reviews, and so then the process would be make a branch, make the change, commit it, push it, get it code reviewed by somebody, merge it into master, then redeploy. Okay, and so you just sort of see the adding the layers of uh, for a bigger company, that's what you would do. But the same basic process is, you know, find a bug, fix it, redeploy. Okay. Um, so, did everybody understand that? Any questions about that process? That's awesome. Yeah, and so that's that's you know in practice, if you're like I have no idea what's wrong, go to the logs, probably will tell you. Uh, other rules about as far as bugs, um, <clears throat> sometimes bugs are new and nobody knows them before. Usually, bugs are the result of something changed. And so, if you're wondering what went wrong, why is this broken, start at the most recent change you made. That's probably why it's broken. Okay, and you sort of work your way backwards from there. Now, like I said, sometimes. Uh, errors have been there for years, right? Uh, and that nobody noticed them before. And so then looking at recent changes isn't going to help you. But um, that's unlikely. Uh, but that does happen. My favorite thing about that is often, um, you know, if you have a, a big team or something and maybe you have a 
project manager, somebody who's submitting these issues. Uh, it's funny sometimes they'll submit an issue like that and say, urgent, got to fix it right now. And then you say, it's been a bug for two years. It wasn't urgent yesterday. What made it urgent today? Uh, but but uh, yeah, that sometimes happens. <clears throat> Um, so other things that are good to know, uh, if, if you're doing the Git <coughs> model, uh, I try to, uh, so typically you'd be using a bug tracker, so maybe I'll show you that in GitHub. I guess I can show you the whole process since we have this uh, in here. Um, so typically you, you can use uh, inside of GitHub, there's issues here, which are, is really cool. So I'm going to make a new issue and say, um, uh, so getting 500 on uh, this URL, right? And then, you know, maybe I'd put a screenshot of the 500 or something, uh, but so normally there'd be more content than this issue. You'd see the issue, and then uh, you might come in here, and different companies do different things. You might label it with a priority. Um, you might say this is a bug, not a feature, that kind of stuff. Uh, but then the process would be, um, when I do a commit, uh, so I'm in, I use git status to see the current status, and I added these, these files, okay? And now I would do the commit, I would say git commit, and I would put in here, um, you know, fixed 500 error, but I would typically do this. I would come in here, grab the issue number, right, and say, like in parentheses, um, something like that, okay? And you want to just put in uh, more stuff, made changes, <laughs> joking. Yeah, Like yeah. bad commit messages. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and so I'm just giving a little context. I, the important thing to me, though, is that I, I have the number in here, uh, because then I can reference the commit with the with what's in here, okay? And so that's sometimes helpful. Um, it may do this automatically. Sometimes it does, but sometimes you have to create a branch and do it that way. Uh, but anyway, the point is then once you've fixed it, redeployed it, you'd say, uh, "Why is this going slow?" There it is. And because I put the issue number in there, it, it connected wow. the two. Wow. And so then I can easily see the changes that were made. Right? Uh, there's the image I added. And then, you know, all this other stuff. Uh, and then, you know, you can say, uh, it's fixed in production or something. You know, it's sometimes nice to add why it was fixed. You'd comment that, and then you'd close the issue. Um, so that would be the general process. Um, and the nice thing about the issue series, you can have code reviews. Uh, and so, you know, you can use um, thumbs up. Like if you're doing a code review, you know, like, looks good, deploy, you know. And then, and then if, you, if you did that, you would see you're good to go. Uh, and so that's if, if you wanted to do a code review. Um, because they could see the change, right? And then you do the thumbs up, and then you say, deploy it. But that's, that's the process uh, that you often see with projects. So. And it's pretty easy. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit of process, like a, lot of, a few things you have to type, but not too much, right? It's not too painful. Um, and it just, it makes, in the future, tracking down things so much easier when you have this history of all the changes in a project. Um, because like I said, bugs are usually the result of changes, so I can really easily see the most recent changes by just going to the history, and this is going slow today, um, see the commits, right? And you can see all the most recent commits, I can go look at them and see just the things that were changed in that commit, and so on, okay? Um, so that's the general process we would use with, with App Engine. Uh, and that's not too different than most other ways of making software, it's very similar. Not surprising, Google is a software engineering company, and so they have good process for that kind of stuff for App Engine. Okay, so I showed you the logs, and I showed you quotas. Um, 
APIs is something we may use too, um, and so we'll, we'll see that, uh, and that is also in here. So the logs for monitoring logs and APIs in this API section. Google has tons of APIs, and they've been doing this effort, and they're mostly there, of trying to unify all of the APIs into one place mm -hmm. so that you can really easily uh, use them. And so, for example, if I wanted to use Google Maps, um, and so I say I wanted to embed a Google Map on my, on my app, I would have to go to Google Maps Embed API, say Enable. There, I enabled it. It has photos, just like everything has photos. And then you go to um, Credentials. And you could create a new key. In this case, it would be a browser key. You know, and you can like pin it down to a specific domain name. So I could, for example, make it so that only things from this domain can use it. Whoops. And then it gives me this key, and that's the key I would use in my code right here. And that's how you can do a lot of key stuff. So that's a general process where if you use an API that requires a key, a lot of APIs require a key because they don't want people to abuse the API. The key gives them the ability to tie accesses to a specific account. And so if you do too much stuff, they can block you, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, and most of those APIs will tell you that, uh, but all the Google ones you can generate from here. Um, we'll look at maybe an example of a third party API later probably next week sometime. Um, because, like I said, that's a very common thing you have to do in web development is use a third party API. Uh, so maybe we'll see an example of how to use GitHub's API. Uh, but for, for now, if you want to use Google ones, you can do it in here. Any questions about that? Um, yeah, so managing all the keys and stuff. It, and these, there's docs for all this. It, it just, sometimes it's hard to work through. There's like 13 of these consoles, and they're all slightly different. Uh, but they're, they're getting better. Uh, they're, they're almost there. Like, this is almost easy. Almost. <laughs> Until you have to do something that's not in this list, and then you have to go to another API console. But, I oh. love this tour. This is awesome. Uh, and that's, you know, we'll do some more with App Engine. You know, there's, a, there's more stuff in here. Later when we look at storage, there's a whole storage thing here uh, for storage. They also have the data store here, so you can browse around that guy. Um, so there's some cool stuff in here, but in general, that's what we're doing. And like I said, there's App Engine and then Compute Engine, uh, and that's if you're spinning up your own VMs, and there's a lot of stuff for that. Uh, but for App Engine, it's just this stuff in here. So. Cool. And remember, that's console.developers.google.com. That's where you get that console dashboard. Any questions about any of that? Okay, so App Engine is made up of lots of services. And so let's go to the docs just so we can see where that is. So this is cloud.google.com slash app engine slash docs, in, in this case slash go. Uh, and so the basic structure here is that there are all these services, and there's lots of these, and we're gonna talk about a bunch of them. Um, and then there's this storing data, and this is where the data store is. So basically the idea is that mostly your app is Go code, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and then your Go code is usually storing things in the data store and getting them back out again. So in most web apps, most of your work is done with the data store and then the front end code, okay? And your, your Go code is like the plumbing, it's connecting the two pieces together, okay? It's making it so the front end can use the database. It's going through and coming back out again. Um, I know you guys use Firebase, and that's a little different model, but a uh, similar idea. The data store is gonna be the app engine of Firebase. Um, but that's why it's in a separate section, because it's such a big deal. But all the rest of the services are down here. Uh, and the, the first service we're going to look at is users, okay? Um, so we already did user management manually, right? We created sessions and we, we didn't store an account, but we logged in with a hard-coded account in the source code. Um, but the uh, app engine includes uh, great support uh, if you want to be able to log in users using their Google account. So you know how if you go to a Google service, uh, we did it with App Engine. Uh, you guys didn't have to sign up for a new account. 
it just used your current Google account. Okay? And that's a similar capability in App Engine. People can log in with their Google credentials. Uh, and that's really easy to do in, with App Engine. So let's, uh, let's look at an example of that. So in day five here, I'm going to create a new, I'm just going to copy this App Engine app YAML because I'm just going to overwrite my old app. Uh, and I'm going to call this uh, user's example. Actually, this is going to go through a couple iterations. So here's the first one, user's example one. Uh, and we create that new file. And then we'll have a main go in here. And like I said, you don't have to name it main. You can name it whatever you want. But, uh, and so just an init function instead of a main function. And we'll just call this index. Uh, and so I'll make an index function. And so the intention of this example is that we're going to use the user authentication in Go. And so they have an example here. Um, and basically the way this works is there's a special app engine package. Okay, so we import that guy. And then I'm going to need other things too. Maybe it'll fix it for me. Um, you create this context, the C app engine context. And we use that for all the services in App Engine. So I'm going to call it CTX just so that's a little more clear. And you pass it the request, okay? And that creates a context. I'm just going to print it so it lets me use it. Um, okay. It didn't find App Engine because it's not my Go path. Um, so there's a bit of confusion here. The examples are all going to show it like this. It turns out, uh, and I don't know all of the subtleties for why this is, but all of the App Engine code is also available on GitHub. It's getting there. I don't know if it's quite there yet. And it's also available at this google.golang.org slash app engine. OK. And so I think you can import this instead. Um, it has all the same. Let's try that instead. So the difference is that when I just import App Engine, that's code that's inside of App Engine. And so it's not in my Go path. And so Adam doesn't know anything about it. Um, but I can import this directly, I think. We'll see if that works. So I'm going to try go getting that. That actually worked. OK. And then if I save. So just when you see the examples, just know you can also use this whole, whole path instead of just app engine, okay? And like I said, the only difference there is that it lets you, uh, it works better with editors. And I think the same would be true in Western. You've got the same issue. Uh, and I think these are newer, okay? So I think there's a transition going on here from the older to the newer way. So we're adding features to these guys. Uh, but just know you can do that. And then, anyway. Or you can say import app engine. Uh, and then you say uh, dot new context, give it the request, and it gives you a context. Uh, and that's what we use for all the services. And the idea of a context is it's a piece of information that travels along with all of the API requests. It goes with the HTTP requests. It allows you to tie them all together. So for example, if I make a query to the data store, so I ask uh, to get some data from the data store. By using a context, it knows that that came from a specific request. So it, it sort of follows its way along the request, okay? Um, and that's useful, that's useful to know. It makes it uh, easy to sort of connect all the dots together. The other cool thing about context is they have the ability to have a deadline. Uh, and so say you're doing all these requests and you're making backend calls and stuff, and you say, oh, I only want it to take 30 seconds. You can set a deadline after 30 seconds, no matter where it is in this whole lifetime it'll then start to error out, come all the way back. So, um, so they use this context a lot. Now, in general, what we're going to do with it is we just create it and then use it for the service. 
we don't have to worry about what it's doing behind the scenes so much, but just know that you're going to see this create a new context a lot when you work with that. Um, so to work with users, uh, if we go back to the example, and once again, these are just in the docs, uh, you, you do this user.current and give it the context, okay? So let's just see what this is going to look like. Um, I'm going to use fprintline to see the user. Oops, sorry, that should be. Okay. So app engine slash user is the is the uh, package. And then you say user.current and you give it the context, and that will give you the current user based on the request. Uh, so it's getting that information from the request. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you are ready to deploy this app engine, when you change line seven and eight and remove what you are referencing to work locally, to then push it up because, you know. I don't know. We'll, right. we'll find out. I don't, I think you can leave it, but yeah. we'll find out. All right. Um, but let's just see what this does real quick. Am I in the right? No, I'm in Hello World. So users example one. So go app, serve. So let's start it. And then no. No, because there is no current user. I haven't logged in. Um, so that's where it's doing this code. If user is nil, then get the login URL. Okay, so this is another method, uh, function on top of the user package, and it gives you a login URL. Um, so let's do that. So we're going to copy this this bit of the code and see what we get. Um, okay, so what I think this should do is it should show a link, and if I click that link. So let's see if that works. Don't have to restart, which is cool. So it created a link. What does that link have in it? Um, it has a special link, which is a little hard to read, but it says slash underscore ah slash login. Now, on the actual app engine, that would be a little different. But this is the development web server that's simulating App Engine. Uh, and so that's what it'll be for local. And so if we click that, this is like a fake login page that the development web server gives us. In the real one, this would be like the regular Google login thing. Uh, and so we just say log in, and it takes us back. Okay. So just to reiterate here, see this continue? So when I click that link, it added this continue on at the end. That's how it knows to go back to our website. So it signs us in. It's going to write a cookie and stuff. Uh, and then when we come back here, it logs us in. We have test at example.com. That's what the user is now. Uh, and then if we look in our resources, cookies, uh, it added a cookie. So it added this. So it's doing what we were doing before. So it's doing it for us, okay? Managing session and all that. Uh, which is great, means we don't have to write that. Um, so then let's do this final bit here, which is a logout URL. And I think it just changes to So all it's going to do now, it, it creates a login URL if you're not logged in. And if you are logged in, so because it's returned, if you are logged in, it creates a logout URL and we'll show that instead. Okay? So, it, it did do it, it just didn't do it as HTML. <laughs> we just got to add the content type. That's funny. Uh, I 
And that's because it didn't know it was HTML because it didn't have a, a tag. That was like, I don't know what that is. Um, there we go. So it said, welcome. You get the email and you can click sign out. Now when you're back out, it deleted the cookie. It's gone. Let me clear these so it's more obvious. So, and that was from the example, but I'll push this up. But uh, yeah, create a context and get the current user. This can be nil, but if it is nil, that means they're not logged in. And so then we ask them to log in. And if it's not nil, we can get the logout link by the okay. So we don't have to create the slash login pages or slash logout pages because those are being given by Google. All we have to do is look at the current context, user current, to find the current user. And we can Using that, we can know um, if he's logged in. Uh, and so, if we go here to user the, sorry, this is the. So if we go to slash user, that's the package. Um, we can see all the details. So when you do current, it returns a pointer to a user. And so you have these properties: email, admin would be true or false, um, etc. Admin is a property of how you set up your app. Um, and so. That's another benefit of App Engine. Like, it's based on your user information in Google. Uh, and so who's an admin or not is managed, right? It's managed through, the, through this set of stuff here, right? And so you can add an admin and all that stuff. Um, so that's really cool. I don't have to create a special admin management page. I can manage it here. And then if they log in using you know, their Google account, and I've added it here, they're admins. Okay. Um, everybody following the basic structure here? Okay. So that's users. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's really, it's pretty easy. It's easier than what we were doing. Uh, the downside being, you have to use Google Logins, uh, which maybe is no big deal, but if you're like maybe a really big company, you don't want, to, you don't want people to know you're running on Google, maybe that's the problem. Um, but if, you, if you're willing to use Google logins, it's fantastic. Right? So what do we do if you don't have, if you don't want to use Google logins? Anybody think of what you do? Does Google login work on Firefox? I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, all, it all works. Uh, it's just like using Gmail or whatever. Um, and it works on mobile phones and all that too. Uh, but what if you don't want to use it? Well, would you just have to do your own session management? Exactly. Like we did a day or exactly. two ago. There's nothing preventing you from doing it yourself. Yes. Okay. So I just sometimes when people are presented with this, like, oh, so I can't do my own? It's like, no, no, you can do your own. Nothing's stopping you from doing your own. It's just they made using theirs really easy, which you can understand that Google, and they want to own your entire login process. But uh, just because they made it easy doesn't mean you can't do it the hard way. Um, so the other thing you can do here is in the YAML file, you can. Uh, specify whether a certain URL requires login. So let's try that. Um, here we go. So these are the handlers, and I can just add login required. So let's see what that does. So I add login required. Okay. I don't know if you need to restart. I don't think you do. It says it detected it. Okay. Notice what it did there? Mm -hmm. It automatically took me to the login page because login's required. So the first time I go to a page, if it's the login's required, it will redirect me to the Google login thing and it put the continue. Then I log in. So what that means is using that, um, let me commit this real quick without it. I don't have to add the, the custom, oops. I don't have to add in here 
uh, I don't have to add this bit. Okay. Because it did that for me. So I don't even have to create the login link anymore. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like an injecting that code before this request. That only works uh, on the YAML if you're using uh, App Engine login user services. That's right. So if you want to do it through the YAML, you got to use Google. They used to support OpenID, and the, they, apparently they still do, but they want to get rid of that. So and probably OpenID should be. would be login with Google, Facebook, whatever. OpenID was a neat idea, idea but I don't know. It never really took off. But yeah. It was like uh, you could create your own uh, provider and there was a common protocol for logging in and stuff. Um, but like I said, it's, it's basically dead and they're deprecating it and so, uh, you know, why try to learn something that we just can get rid of? Um, no, so if you want to use something that's not Google, just roll your own, which isn't that hard. It is annoying. But, um, but if you don't care, just use what Google has for the DB. Um, and so, yeah, and so now we don't even have to create, we can sort of assume users are all, always logged in because we said logins required. So it'll never get to our handler if they're not logged in. Okay. Uh, at least I think that's true. What happens if you hit, oh, I stopped the server. get there without it's always going to take you here so um, so we don't have to write like, the rest of the code okay and so we still need to make a logout link just because we want to put that on our site but uh, we don't we don't have to make the login page anymore so the other thing we can do there in addition to saying required is we can say admin uh, so So let's try that. Login, admin. And so I'll do it as a separate path so we can see both. So URL slash admin slash start. I think that's what they have in theirs. Yep. We do the same script. And then we say login admin. Okay. Uh, just this is a regular expression. Dot means any character, star means zero or more. So. Okay, a question? Yeah. What, so the, the script, what is Go app referring to? Because, uh, it's like a, it's name. a special name they just created, and it means run under Go app. Okay. If for Go applications, it should always be Go app. Okay, all right. Um, what is there? They got three other ways that they support. So. Yeah, so it's just kind of a holdover that had more meaning in some other yeah, so I think in the Python one, you can specify them a file. But that concept's kind of meaningless for Go, so. Yeah. Um, so let's make an admin. And well, now we're going to see what you have to do, right? Um, because otherwise, it's going to go to index. Both of those URLs go to index, because it's slash, and everything matches slash. So we want to create one just for admin, and so we're going to make a separate function. So let's just do the same thing here. Welcome to admin. Okay. Um, and so I just need to add the route here. And just uh, remember it ends with a slash, right? So everything inside there, not yep. just that. Exactly. Uh, and so now if I go to slash admin, it goes to this. But because in the YAML it says login admin, it only gets here if the user's an admin. So let's see if that works. Yeah, yeah, I'll log in as. Okay, so now, now I log in as a regular user on testexample.com, not an admin. I try to go to admin. I think it's supposed to require an admin. Maybe test by default instead as admin. I think there's even, was there a little admin switch on the login thing? I thought there was. I think you have to, I think the, uh, the handlers on the app YAML go in order, test in order. Ooh, somebody's been reading. Oh, good point. 
Tricky. Thank you. Daniel yeah, gets a gold star. Yeah. Go. It doesn't matter. But in there it does. Okay. Let's see if that fixes it. Yes. Current login user test to get like not authorized in this page. So what happens is if you are logged in, it's not going to redirect you to a login page. It's going to be an error. And the reason it does that is <clears throat> mostly when you're working websites, users have one login. Okay? They don't have two logins, they have one. So if they're logged in, that means they're logged in with their user account. So there's no reason to redirect them to a login page, right? It just means they're not admins. So how do we fix that? We go back to the here, log out, and then we try to go to slash admin. Then it redirects us here, click sign as administrator, and now we're good. Okay? And whether or not you're an admin, like I said, is, is managed here. So, any questions about that? Good catch, Daniel. Yeah, awesome. These, these are the priority orders, so you need to put this one first, otherwise this one would match it, and this would never happen. Because slash star also matches slash end and slash star. So. Okay, so that's how that's an easy way to enforce requiring an admin is just use login admin and then Google's doing it for you. Which means you can maybe guess where we're going now. We can modify the photo blog app so it uses Google logins. Okay? Cool. So that's the task uh, for now. Maybe the next half hour or so. Cool.